Shabbat Shalom. So uh, again, we want to say welcome to the confirmation class. It's wonderful to have you here. And uh, welcome back to Sandy and Sheva. Wonderful to have you here. Um, sometimes I'm just overwhelmed uh, at the number of things happening. We had our Mishnah class at 845. Um, and then we had uh, healing yoga uh, took place in the Friedman Center um, that uh, happens once a month. It's a wonderful um, uh, exercise in yoga and healing for um, many members of our community and uh, Margie Statinsky leads that. Uh, last night we had our first Fridays group here um, and uh, celebrated a wonderful Shabbat meal and Kabbalah Shabbat together. Um, during the service we had, uh, in addition to healing yoga, uh, Sheva taught um, a, uh, a, a Yiddish poetry um, on, on the Parsha, um, and uh, just a tremendous amount happening. You're going to hear in the announcements so much happening um, in the community. One thing that we, the, uh, an announcement, we did have a speaker from 1 to 2 o'clock today, um, an Israeli Arab named Yah ya Mahmid, who um, is not going to be speaking today here. Um, he's not feeling well, but he will be speaking tomorrow at the, um, at the JCC. So that one you can cross off your calendar. Um, but a lot, lot going on uh, for which we are incredibly grateful. Uh, I want to take a moment to look again just at one verse in the Torah portion, um, and actually the first verse, but as a way of, uh, of looking into a very complicated issue in the Jewish tradition. Um, and to be clear, rabbinic tradition, uh, it is very rare for you to find um, an essay written by a, uh, certainly not a rabbi of the Talmud, and even later in rabbinic tradition, um, we don't have sort of long essays or books on particular, uh, on particular ideas. Um, more often than not, the, when you want to find someone's ideas on a particular, uh, uh, someone's opinions on a particular concept or notion within the Jewish tradition, uh, you find it as part of a commentary to a text. And very often, that's a commentary uh, on the text of the Torah. And that is the case with the first verse of this week's Torah portion, um, which reads as follows, elav Adonai petach hayom. God appeared to him by the oaks, by the terebinths of Mamre. Um, he was sitting at the entrance of the tent as the, as the day grew hot. And then the second verse begins the narrative that we read. Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. As soon as he saw them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to greet them. And bowing to the, bowing to the ground, he said, my lords, if it please you, do not go on past your servant, Now, who, etc. And who is it that's being referred to in all of this? We don't have a name yet. Um, it refers to Avraham, right? Now, the, it's a very strange thing for the Torah to begin the, a new Torah portion um, without telling you who's being referred to. Vayera elav Adonai, God appeared to him. And the interpretation of what is happening in these two verses, if you double click on it, so to speak, you will find actually a foundational argument about the nature of prophecy. About the, what does it mean? What do we mean when we say that God appeared to him, God appeared to Avraham by the oaks of Mamre? What does that mean? Does that mean that, that you are standing, you're awake, and there's some sort of you know, dramatic 3D sci-fi revelation that happens? Or does it mean that maybe it's kind of a, a, a daydream? Or maybe it is actually being asleep and having a dream? Um, these are different notions, and the rabbis get very upset about, uh, they get, well, let's not say upset, but they argue a lot about what is actually happening. And I just wanna, um, I just wanna point you in two directions. Okay, the argument here is between Maimonides and Nachmanides, two great rabbis of the medieval period, um, two great Spanish rabbis of the medieval period, and Maimonides is going to interpret it as follows. 
when it says the Lord appeared to him, the Lord appeared to Abraham, by the terebinth of Mamre, he was sitting at the entrance of the tent as the day grew hot. Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. The way he interprets that is God appeared to Abraham. And what was the content of that revelation? The content of the revelation was that three men appeared standing next to him. Okay? You understand how he's reading that? It's essentially a, God appeared to Abraham, colon, Right? And what comes next is the description of what the revelation was. Okay? Because the Torah actually doesn't tell you what was the revelation. Right? Usually if it says God appeared to somebody or God spoke to someone, it tells you, and God said, or and God commanded, or something like that. There's no description of what the revelation is. And Maimonides wants to be clear that the revelation is what follows. And for Maimonides... Um, this is uh, prophecy in general is all a dream. It's either a dream that one is asleep during, or it can be essentially a wakeful state of a vision, um, a daydream that we might, um, that, uh, something that we might encounter as a daydream. And he says that prophecy doesn't come from God for a prophet, but rather it arises from the prophet himself. Okay, and I'm going to read you a short passage from uh, a wonderful, if very complicated, book on Maimonides by the scholar Moshe Halbertal, who has been here at Bethel a number of years ago, I think for Rabbi Sager's uh, uh, 25th year, uh, to celebrate his 25th year in the congregation. Let me just read you this, this paragraph. The contents of a prophet's dream, like those of all dreams, are influenced by the prophet's waking life. Okay? So I'm sure we've all had this experience where it's stressed about something, and then lo and behold, we find that we had a dream at night, and the all of our stresses are showing up in our dreams. But, but because the prophet is engaged closely with the intelligibles, the prophet is someone who is really tapped into what is real in the world. The images he creates in his dreams are, in effect, a symbolic translation of profound insights regarding the true and the false, the good and the bad. So when the prophet has a dream, that dream is based upon the prophet's waking life or regular life, but they are symbolic translations of that regular life because the prophet is someone who's tapped into a very clear sense of what's true and false and what's good and bad. It may be compared, and I'm looking this way, by the way, I'm looking this way at Mike Resnick, okay? Mike is, is a... Um, a wonderful person. He's part of our mob. That doesn't mean part of the mafia. It means it's an acronym for Men of Bethel. He is one of our mob bosses. He's um, engaged in the congregation. He's also a wonderful scientist, a wonderful world-class geneticist, and he is a sparring partner um, as a, a, a proclaimed atheist. Okay? Just, you know, I don't I love, the, I love the kiddish, I like all the people, all the ceremony and stuff, but I don't really believe in this whole God thing, okay? And by the way, I got his permission to do this to him, and lest, <laughs> lest you be worried, it's okay, all right? And, and as I was reading this paragraph, I thought of Mike, because what Halbertal writes about Maimonides' notion of, prof of, of prophecy, he says, it may be compared to a mathematician who awakens in the morning with a solution to a complex mathematical problem that appeared to him. The solution did not appear in the wake of conscious logical analysis, so he didn't figure it out you know, while awake. It's, it, it simply appeared to him while he slept. Importantly, however, this sort of thing only happens to a mathematician purely because he worked on the problem with great intensity while he was awake, okay? So the mathematician, when I go to, let me just be very clear, when I go to sleep at night, I don't wake up in the morning having solved Fermat's theorem, okay? 
I have not figured that out, and that's not going to happen to me. For Maimonides, that would never happen to me because prophecy doesn't come from God. It's not some thing that comes from outside and then gets put into a person and poof, but rather it's the, the mathematician can have this experience of prophecy while asleep because of the work that they've done while awake. And the same thing is true for the prophet, that the prophet has dreams that are very important dreams and true dreams, but that arise from within the, 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 the prophet himself. Um, now, this is important. I'm going to read you a few more sentences from Habertal because of what it means for the rest of this horror portion. Okay? According to Maimonides, when the prophet tells of hearing God speaking to him or seeing an angel, any of these things that happen in the Torah portion, such as the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah that happens by way of an angel, right? Or such as, um, you know, just, many, the, just the basic narrative of this Torah portion, um, he is not reporting on an external event taking place outside his own consciousness. God, oh, yes, you can get some candy. Yeah, yeah. God does not reveal... We understand each other. We know We go way back. Um, God does not reveal himself to the prophet in a dream. Rather, the, 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 um, the, the prophet dreams that God revealed himself to him. And then this is the sentence. The difference between these two concepts is vast. As vast as the difference between going out for a pleasant walk and dreaming about that walk. Did you actually go for a walk? Or did you sit there and you dreamed that you went for a walk? And for Maimonides to be very clear in his formulation of what happens in this Torah portion, Everything that we read, not everything, but, but the main narrative of what we read, and you can, you can tease this out, where exactly does, does essentially Abraham wake up from the dream, right, or wake up from the revelation, but essentially the narrative of this week's Torah portion didn't happen outside of Abraham's mind. The narrative of this week's Torah portion is a description and important stories that point to important truths that arise from Avraham being a person who is tapped into truth and is tapped into good and bad. And so when Avraham even negotiates with God, some of the most important principles in the Torah portion of, of the Jewish tradition are in this week's Torah portion. When, when we when we read the verse, God, when Avram says to God, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? There are a few more important verses that have been uttered in the Bible or in human history because we believe in a God of justice. But for, I don't want to say but, for Avraham, for according to Maimonides, when Avraham says those things, they are, they're not happening in an actual conversation between God and Avraham, but they, it's the content of a dream or a prophecy that is there to teach. Now, I told you if you double-click, then you get the debate. This drives Nachmanides in crazy. <laughs> because essentially, and I'm, and, and I'm not going to walk you through all parts of it, but... How does Nachmanides understand this? This is actually a very creative reading. He says that when, it, when we read Vayera alav elav Adonai be'elonei Mamre, that God appeared to him at the terebinth of Mamre, that actually this is a continuation of from last week's Torah portion. Okay? And I remember I told you that at the end of last week's Torah portion, Avram circumcised himself. Oi! Right? Very difficult. I would say one of the most difficult mitzvahs that there is in the Torah. And, and the revelation comes to, 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 at the end, as a way of saying that Avraham was so obedient and so courageous and 
demonstrated such commitment to God that God rewarded him with a revelation. Okay, so the content of the revelation points backwards and there doesn't need to, for Nachmanides, he says, there doesn't need to be any content. It's essentially sometimes when God wants to grant a reward, the reward is let's spend some time together. Right? And this is, by the way, where the tradition gets the idea that actually Avraham, that God appears to Avraham in order to visit him um, when he is sick, which is another incredibly important mitzvah that we has its ground in this week's Torah portion. The mitzvah that we should visit the sick and our community of care is so involved in this. And if you want, there are people who are in constant need of, of, of company, not because the, not because our company makes them magically feel better, but because it communicates you're not alone. That mitzvah comes from this moment. We're told that we should do this because doing so is imitating God. And when did God visit the sick? With Avraham. So the revelation is the visiting of, it, 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 you know, um, is the conclusion of what comes after. And then when it says... Looking up, he saw three men standing near him. That's real. Because Nachmanides says, if you, if you, if you follow Maimonides, that means that when it says that the angel, that people ate, nobody actually ate. <laughs> right? And when it says that there was this conversation happening, nothing, you know, no, nobody actually spoke. When it says that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, nobody, nothing actually happened. And Nachmanides says this makes a, a forgery of the Torah. And you can't do that. <laughs> so, first of all, I, he, here's what I would like to say to, to Mike, and I'm constantly saying this to you, but I'm saying it to all of us, which is that if we struggle with the supernatural elements in the Torah, if we struggle with the idea of prophecy as being something like from a sci-fi movie where God whispers into your ear and says, um, do this and do that, we are not alone and we are not outside of the Jewish tradition. So Mike can say he's an atheist all he wants, but I say he's a good Jew. <laughs> I, say that he, I say that he follows in the footsteps of Maimonides, who sought a rational understanding of the Torah, and that that is deeply Jewish and a deeply, a deeply ingrained part of our tradition. And if you read this and you say to Maimonides, that big leaves you with nothing. You're also on good terms with the tradition because Nachmanides says, hey, wait a minute. Hey, you can't say that, every, you know, that, that this is just all naturalistic stuff because it le it's a stretch. It leaves you with really pushed readings. And both of those are okay. And both of those are Jewish. And both of those are deeply part of the Torah and arise from our tradition. And the study of our tradition reading the commentaries of Ramban and reading the commentaries of Maimonides opens us up into a deep world that may not appear the way that we are used to through essays um, and, and lengthy discourses where everything follows one thing from, from another. We have to learn a different way in, but that richness and that depth is there. And it is one of the reasons why this community is so rich in learning with classes on the Mishnah and on Yiddish poetry and experiences like healing yoga and the reading of the Parsha and the questioning and the answer because that is a world of depth that enriches all of us. Shabbat Shalom.